This is week six of PEEP cohort one Thursday session. Julius, take it away. All right. Hi, everybody. Hope everybody's doing good. So yeah, so this week we're going to be talking about breeds. So basically, this is just going to be an overview of the chicken breeds, more specific to what you guys are doing. I think Annie sent an email with a link uh, to the American Poultry Association. So if you guys have time, check that out. And for that matter, if, um, you know, if you are inclined to get more info about chickens, I suggest any questions that you have that you need more info in depth, um, just go online and there's a bunch of info and what I stress you know in the beginning when you do do research um, always take into consideration you know like we're in Hawaii subtropical climate a lot of the stuff that is shared might not pertain to us but you know there's always good information to glean on okay so we're going to talk about a little bit about origins Dr. Ja touched on this. The chicken is basically, I guess the ancestors were from the jungle fowl uh, that live at least uh, 2000 BC. The chickens that we have today uh, were all from the Southeast Asian region. So thought to be in the Malaysia, Indonesia area. There were four different species that the modern chicken was derived from. And the red jungle fowl is the most common in the wild today and is the main ancestor of the domestic chicken. Little side info, this info was, I wanna say 10 years old, so it might not be true today, but it might it might still be. Hawaii has the biggest game bird group or association in the country. I don't know about the world. So yeah, so there's a lot of guys, a lot of people are into um, game birds, um, uh, raising um, some, some of the most prized and sought after chicken breeds in the world. Um, in fact, this is a, I want to say a cottage industry, but it, you know, in Hawaii, there's so much niche industry that it's funny. They categorize them as niche, but you know, they're like million dollar industries, like big industries. So, so with that, you know, cockfighting had tremendous influence in the domestication and distribution of fowls throughout the world. When I saw this info, I, you know, when I was researching how the chickens got around. It wasn't just, you know, um, some European going to Asia and they were like, oh, chickens, let's take them back. You know, not necessarily like that. Maybe they saw how they were used back then and they were like, wow, let's uh, let's do cockfighting back home, you know? So um, at least that's how I envision it. And, really funny. So right now there are 350 combinations of phys physical features today and we'll go over some of those. What, and, what does that mean? Combinations of physical features like beak, feet, tail, feather combination or what is? Right. So physical, both phys I mean, obviously it's all physical. So you can have a comb that has many crowns or you can have a single crown comb. You can have chickens that have wattles that um, droop on the side, the stature, how big they are, okay. the scale of the feet, you know, subtle differences, but generally they all have the same features per se, different varying colors. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I understand. It's just like how diverse they are maybe. So I, I you know, I kind of find it ironic you know, American Poultry Association, you know, they have these standards. Um, well, you know, it was organized for purposes of adopting standards and classifying various breeds. So there are hybrids out there that they don't even recognize, but yet, you know, based on the origins, every chicken is a hybrid, basically. It's just, they were able to preserve a certain lineage, I guess, a hybrid that they consider them as standards. And today, you know, there are some hybrids that, you know, the Amer American Poultry Association won't even recognize because they're just too mixed up, I guess. And there's no one particular defining quality in them that they were like, yeah, we can't really classify these, you know, kind of things. So, but anyway, yeah, so uh, physical features. In fact, a lot of them, you can't really 
aside from feathers and the combs and the wattles that I talked about, a lot of them are very nuanced and you, you won't really tell until you take off the feathers. I guess I'm just in a, a different position where we slaughter chickens. And so we've slaughtered chickens that obviously that we grow in there. We slaughtered for other people. We've slaughtered other types of poultry, um, ducks, turkeys, quails. You know, the physical features are all the same, but the nuanced differences you can tell um, based on, you know, the different uh, types of poultry. Um, same thing with the chicken. Like, say, for example, the chickens that you guys have, the production reds, we've slaughtered those before. Compared to the chickens that we grow, totally different as far as, like, the breastbone, the legs, and, and whatnot. I mean, same structure, but nuanced differences. So the poultry industry today, I guess, can be categorized in three different uh, segments. So you have your purebred poultry, poultry for egg and poultry poultry for meat. Of course, all poultry provide eggs. You know, that's how they reproduce. And um, they can be eaten for meat. However, certain poultry were, were hybridized or bred for producing eggs and certain poultry, again, for, for meat. So the poultry for egg and meat basically dominate all the poultry in the world. That's the most poultry that is out there today. The purebred poultry, on the other hand, um, it's more for preserving lineage. And then at the same time, you know, it's one of those things, like I mentioned before, it's like a niche market, small segment, you know, compared to the whole poultry industry as a, as a whole, but it's a crazy big um, market. I don't know if you guys ever seen, or I don't know if it's still on Netflix. There's a movie or documentary, whatever you call it, um, called The Chicken People. I think I've watched like 20 minutes of it and I couldn't stand it. And, you know, we raise chickens for a living and I couldn't stand these people. It was just a little bizarre for me. And that movie is solely focused on that purebred poultry industry. You know, the chickens that are used for show, uh, competition. So these are the segments of the industry. Again, because we use poultry for eggs and meat, you know, that dominates pretty much what the poultry industry is about. You know, it, it doesn't matter if, if it's chickens or or waterfowls, uh, like ducks, geese, quail, pheasant, that includes everybody. So let's talk about bantams and large fowl. So bantam is um, is a type of chicken, uh, which is basically just, a, it's, I guess, another term for a small chicken. And large fowl is the standard size chickens that we see. Um, and this particular picture is a Brahma. Brahmas are, are big chickens. And so the smaller version of them is called a, a bantam. I, I, I wanted to bring this up because, you know, all the years we've been doing chickens, I hear, you know, when I go to the hatchery or where, or when I'm, you know, in a seminar or whatever, you know, people talking about bantams. I've ever, I've always heard of bantams and I, I didn't know what the heck what a bantam was and I didn't want to look like an idiot. So yeah, so it really just a bantam is a term for a small chicken, a small version of a regular sized chicken. And normally they are between one third and half the size of a regular standard size fowl. Obviously they eat less feed and produce legs, less eggs compared to large fowls. And then there are true bantams they have no large fowl counterparts. Like say this one, it's a Brahma. It has a, a, a bantam. So this is the large fowl and you know, this is the bantam counterpart. So true bantams, they don't have a bigger version is what, is what that means, true bantam. And these are three examples of not having a big hen counterpart or a big fowl counterpart, a big standard size chicken counterpart. Okay, and then large fowl are really just the regular standard size chickens. The one on the left is a uh, Red Ranger, dual purpose bird, really good, really good meat. Nobody wants to buy them. Actually, they're too expensive to raise, <laughs> but really good meat. So just some terms, a rooster or cock is an adult male bird. A cockerel is a young male bird, not chick anymore, but not quite an adult yet. A capon is a castrated male in the poultry for meat industry. Uh, they prefer to raise male birds 
that's because they grow bigger, faster, you know, which means more meat. So they castrate them. So all the energy is focused on the growing part as opposed to uh, growing the reproductive system. And then a hen is an adult female bird. Oh, and I don't know how they castrate chickens, uh, if, if you're wondering. <laughs> And I didn't research that. Well, we don't do it anyway, because we raise uh, we raise straight run birds, meaning we raise um, uh, both male and female. And then a pullet is a sexually immature female, not a chick anymore, but not laying hen yet. Um, it's called a pullet. A clutch. This is a term I just found out recently, or yeah, last week. They called a group of baby chicks a clutch. People also call them peep, but I also saw that clutch is also a term to describe a group of eggs. And then a brood is a group of hens. Okay, now let's look into chickens or classifications according to their origin. So these are examples of Asiatic birds. The one on the top left is called a Brahma, really big chicken. Um, and these are interesting chickens to me because they have shoes or it looks like shoes. Um, they got feathers all the way to their, um, almost to their feet. And I think the cushions are, are, are similar. Brahma and the long son are kind of similar. Oh, and Brahmas are big birds, uh, kind of hefty. I, I, I didn't put a picture because they look similar to the Brahma. The cushion is a picture on the right, the top right. Uh, it, that's a blue cushion, um, really small birds. When I read about cushions, they said they originated in China, which basically mean, you know, they migrate or they took them to China and then they bred, bred them a certain way. So yeah, they're very distinct. I think they have shoes too. At least that's how I describe it. Um, really cute to me. They look like pet chickens, you know. And then the one on the bottom is called an aseal. This one is a really interesting chicken. It stands up a little differently than than the other chickens. It's uh, broad chested and really tall. Can get up to three feet if I'm not mistaken. A few years ago, when I had a job, I collected or I requested some huli for planting from this guy in Waimanalo, and then we got to talk story and. I told him what, you know, at the time I was, we, we already started the farm, but I still had a job. I told him what, what I do part-time because I, I had a part-time job in it. So he said, come follow me. And we went behind his office and boom, I see these guys, a seal. He's the only one, I, I think, at least uh, uh, till, till now, that have a seal chickens. Um, in Hawaii. Um, I know there's a few people in the mainland um, that have these chickens. You can't really uh, import um, some chicken breeds uh, because of disease. This is one of them. In Japan, this is, this is a delicacy. It's famous. Um, they call it shamu chicken. Um, really expensive dish. Shamu sounds like a whale, but anyway, so um, we were gonna raise these and sell them because you know he told me about the market but um didn't quite work out oh by the way on the american poultry association website there is a there is a list of all the chicken breeds um that are recognized you know by the association today and it gives you the type the breed and basically where it's from and then these ones are the English. So top left is the Astrolorp, really beautiful bird from Australia. Astrolorp is pretty good too um, when it comes to laying eggs, which we'll talk about later. And then the top right is the Cornish, really small bird, but uh, really popular. The one on the bottom right is the Dorking. And the one on the left bottom is the Orpington. And these ones are Mediterranean, probably the most popular breed in the world because it's heavily used is the leghorn. Prolific egg layer, by far 
the standard as far as uh, production. Um, so if you ever buy white eggs in the supermarket or any store, chances are they are from a leghorn. So the Minorca is on the bottom right, kind of still have that speckle, but it has that um, from neck to head, it's, it has that white feather feature. The one on the top right is the Anconas. Similar to the Plymouth Rock, it's also a good egg layer uh, breed, which we'll talk about later. And then the bottom left is the Fayumi. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It has that white spot right next to its waddle. Really beautiful chicken. The most popular American breed is the Rhode Island Red. Really in interesting uh, origin story to that too. Um, so if you guys get the chance, go read it up. The one on the, the top right is Limit Rock. I see these a lot over here. The one on the bottom right is the New Hampshire. And then the one on the left is the Jersey Giant. I don't know if you can tell by the picture, but that bird is big, really big. Any questions so far? How big are the eggs that that chicken lays? <laughs> yes, they're extra large uh, brown eggs. I, I mean, I've heard of Jersey Giant before, and I just thought it was just a moniker, you know, until I saw pictures and I'm like, okay, they weren't kidding when they call them giants. Actually, the Brahma is kind of similar. It is pretty big too. I think the biggest chicken we've ever raised, 11 pounds dress weight. So I think it was like 14, 15 pounds. And then the biggest turkey we slaughtered was 49 pounds dress weight, meaning all the feathers and everything else was off. I had to help my sister take it out of the scalder. And I thought it was going to break our um, feather picker machine. Yeah, that was that was a beast. So I would think it'll be similar. Eh, maybe not. Okay, let's talk about the most productive breeds. So this is the Ancona chickens. Uh, this particular one, they call it the Italian or they call another. Um, it's from Italy. Um, these one, they call them Italian black beauties. Um, they lay 220 to 300 large white eggs a year. Five six per uh six eggs a week and this one the astralorp this one is a cross between the orpington and rhode island reds um, they lay medium light brown eggs and kind of similar to the anconas really beautiful feathers astralorp it has that um black and with that greenish sheen to the feathers and these are the black star uh cross between the bard Plymouth Rock and Hen and a Rhode Island Red or New Hampshire male. You can kind of tell with that New Hampshire um, crest and neck and then the rest of the body is uh, looks like a Plymouth Rock. Not a speckled but still. When breeding chickens does it matter which is the male and which is the female? Yes it does. So I don't know if you guys heard of the term sex link. They breed um, chickens so they can distinguish between a male and a female when they have distinguishable features, consistent distinguishable features to determine if it is a male or female, they call it a sex link. You know, not like, say, for example, you have two breeds of dogs and then you mix them and then you might get a white, you might get a black, you might get spotted ones, you know, with sex links chicken. You know, they're breeding it specifically so that they can tell right away if it's going to be a male or a female. And then also with chickens, when they breed them, they're trying to get a feature from one or the other, like say a feature from a hen that they want and a feature from a male that they want, make a hybrid based on how they want it. Like say, for example, the, the meat chickens, it's a hybrid between a Cornish hen and a Plymouth Rock, a Plymouth or Bard Rock. So the Cornish is for the breast because, um, you know, they want the broad breast um, feature. Mm -hmm. And then the Plymouth Rock or Bard Rock, they wanted the stature. When they breed okay. those together, the the chicken will produce uh, a, bre a broad breasted breast, uh, which is um, where the dominant meat is coming from. But, you know, with the stature, they wanted you know, eyes and legs, right? So th that's one. And then the other one is what I brought up earlier, the Red Ranger, for example. That one, the breast is not as broad. It's more narrow, but it has a lot of meat on the thighs and the legs. 
Red Ranger was bred and it's used in France. That's their standard, how they want chickens to be. Because a lot of people over there prefer the dark meat. In America, they like, you know, the white meat or the breast. Um, similar to Asia, in Asia, people prefer the black meat over the white meat. Recently, it's a little bit different now. Um, but, you know, in years past, like, they, they want chickens that have more meat on their, their, their legs and thighs, with the dark meat, basically. So... Um, they, they breed chickens that will produce as such. You know, when it comes to egg layers, they're getting traits. Like say, for example, if you're gonna grow chickens in a, in a temperate climate, so they're gonna get some traits that can tolerate, you know, the highs and the, uh, the lows of um, temperatures. Or if say, for example, you're, you know, you're gonna raise chickens in like a consistent cold weather environment, then they're gonna breed something like that. Okay, now this is the Golden Comet chicken, the cross between a New Hampshire rooster and a white rock hen. When I was researching these these chickens, you know, this one looked like a Rhode Island red. Again, you know, it's really subtle differences, but, you know, just by looking at it, it looks like, oh, it's a brown egg layer. You know, it does lay brown egg. Let's jump to, you know, like this one, the Loman brown chicken or the Rhode Island red. You know, they're all brown. Although this one has black tips on the on the tail feathers, um, this one kind of have a white. And then if we go back to the golden comet, it has a white. But you know, unless you really look at the subtle differences, they all look like brown to me. They breed these chickens, or they hybridize them to get them to be a egg producing chicken. So this one it lays 300 to 330 large to extra large brown eggs a year for the first two years and it drops to 250 on the third year. Typically for production uh, chicken, peak usually goes to two years. You know, some commercial farms, big commercial farms, once they determine the, the peak, they transition those chickens. They won't keep them anymore because it's such a big production. But some of these chickens, they can grow or they can lay or live up to eight years. It just depends on the care. Okay, so leghorns originally called were Italian, originally were called Italians. Like I said, these are the standard. They lay 280 to 320 extra large white eggs a year. Most of the farms were, you know, uh, most production farms are, are using leg. Our old landlord, when we started raising our, our chickens, she wouldn't take our eggs because they're brown. And so my wife asked, what, why not? She said, you know, them growing up, they always eat white eggs because they thought brown eggs were dirty, <laughs> which I thought was funny. And that's the prevailing thought. And that's why I think most of the eggs that are sold are white. Of course, you know, different color eggs have been, have been sold on supermarkets forever, but the most dominant eggs on the market are white and that's because you know it's associated with it being clean right of course the trend is actually different now maybe not but at least the perception people think like brown eggs are healthier which in reality is not the case it's all about what you feed the chickens right if you feed it nutritious uh, balanced diet that's where you know the nutrients come from and not necessarily the color and then this is the Loman brown chicken, best egg layer in Africa. It's a cross between a New Hampshire cock and a brown laying hen. 300 to 325 brown eggs a year. I don't know if, if these are available here. Now, I was talking to the hatchery yesterday. Our neighbor used to raise quail and we were buying quail eggs from them. Well, we resell the quail eggs and we were moving over 300 eggs a week and then the guy had some health issues so he had to stop doing it he was trying to sell the operation to us but wasn't ready at the time the hatchery reached out and uh, one of the popular eateries reached out a couple weeks ago and then the hatchery reached out uh, yesterday a lot of people are asking for quail eggs you know i kind of told this story and i said can you bring in eggs and hatch for me and then i can breed them and build my flock and she said she can't bring eggs to hatch, but she can bring the quail themselves. And I said, that doesn't make any sense. What, why? Because she said I, they need to get a lot of permit 
to get the eggs, it's not even a permit. Like you gotta justify it with the Department of Ag to bring the eggs as opposed to if bringing the quail. Because normally what they do is they bring in the eggs and then they hatch them. You know, like for, for our meat birds, um, that's what they do. For egg layers or whatever other breeds, because they do other breeds, they, they bring in the eggs and then they hatch it at the hatch at their hatchery. I don't know, maybe that's something we're looking into because quails are ready in six weeks. They will be laying eggs in six weeks. But they're really small. Like, what do people do with them? Like, just bougie food? Yes. Uh, literally. <laughs> Uh, there's a it's 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 big in Asian markets even for some high-end restaurant French chefs you know they use quail eggs quail meat is good too but of course you gotta slaughter them I know in Oahu there's no big quail producer there's a lot of backyard producers there's never enough quail eggs produce or you know, something to think about okay uh, Rhode Island Reds uh, official bird of Rhode Island. We're bred as dual purpose. They're bred for meat and also for, for laying. Two to 300 brown eggs a year. These guys get can get big. Mm -hmm. I've never raised Rhode Island Reds. We always had production Reds. I thought they were a cross between, or oh, the production Red, at least the ones that you guys are getting, uh, Rhode Island Reds and Leghorn. But it's not the case. It's New Hampshire and Rhode Island Red Cross. This is all I've heard every time. When you have brown chickens, everybody refer to them as Rhode Island Reds. So nuance differences, they all look chicken to me. In the beginning, they all look like chicken to me until, you know, we started doing more and, you know, and then you can see. Let's talk about uh, the different color eggs and the particular breed that uh, lay them. So the Americanas, they lay blue eggs. They're a crossbreed between Aracana and the America chickens. Um, really beautiful chickens. These are really popular. I know at the hatchery, they hatch these a lot, I think. These and the Plymouth Rock. So they lay 150 to 200 blue eggs a year. So obviously not quite the production type, but for novelty, it's kind of cool having blue eggs, right? There is a pigmentation in their reproductive system that gives the eggs that color. And then here's the Arcana. Pure breeds are rare. So if you are buying an Arcana, just beware that the pure bred are really rare. Most of the time, the Arcanas that are out there, they're a hybrid. This bird is a native to Chile. Native, again, you know, um, relatively speaking. They lay about 260 blue eggs a year. Looks like a cartoon character. And then you got the Easter egg. Um, considered a mutt chicken. They're not even part of the classification by the American Poultry Association. Because again, there's no distinguishable feature that they can pinpoint for them to say, okay, this belongs here, whatever, whatever. You basically get what you get. It's like my Christmas presents every year. I don't know what I'm going to get. Maybe sock this year, candies next year. So they can lay blue, green, olive, or even pink eggs. So right there. Years ago, I don't know if I heard the story or if I read the story. They said that there's a bacteria that causes the different color pigmentation on the eggs aside from the white and the brown because those are the most dominant ones. So obviously you got blue, pink, green. I haven't seen that literature ever, anywhere since, so might be a wrong info. So there is a pigmentation that is part of the reproductive system. And what I should have done is show you a slide. I'll show you a picture of from the uterus to the egg formation to the egg itself. Like I said, we slaughtered um, egg laying hens. They thought to be, you know, the the person who brought them thought that they're, they have peak production. They decided, okay, time to transition the chicken. So they brought them over to us. And it was not uncommon when we eviscerate the chicken that there are still eggs in the embryonic stage. I don't know if that's even the right term. But um, so on the uterus, there's basically little bubbles, little orange bubbles which is basically the yolk. And then all along the reproductive track, you can see the transition. So those little 
orange bubble, you know, they get bigger. And then as they get close to the vent, you, you can see it being encapsul encapsulated by the membrane and then eventually the shell. When we eviscerate, it's not uncommon when we stick our hand in, pull the viscera out, an egg or two will come out along with the um, with the yolk. So actually, we're going to talk about that too on part one or part two of that class because at some point you're going to have to decide what are you going to do with those hens that are not producing anymore. You can keep them or you want to transition them or you want to pass them on to another person. It's, it's up to you. Just think, you know, if, if you are running a business, you can't have something that you're going to pay for that is not giving you any type of return unless it's some kind of return. Okay, any questions? I have a question. Don't laugh at me, but um, somebody told me that they were able to get their chickens to lay blue eggs after they fed their chickens a lot of beets. A lot of beets? Yeah, you know, like beets. B yeah, yeah. E beets. Huh. And were they pulling my leg or... I hate to call it designer egg, but... I right. mean, is that even possible? If they're, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I've never heard that before. The chicken have nutritional needs, and I think uh, Dr. Ja talked about it. So, in order for them to produce consistently, you know, those needs need to be met. So, a lot of the uh, the feed that we buy from the store specifically formulated you know to meet those needs so the feed that we buy you know the layer feed which is a 16 percent protein content a lot of times that's what they they base the feed formulation for commercial producers um, they can have as much as five or six different formulations for their chicken whereas you know like for backyard producers or small scale producers if you get the chicks right so you use the starter feed until about 18 to 20 weeks. So once they start laying eggs, you can't use the, the starter feed anymore because one, it's expensive. And two, because their nutritional needs are going to change. The formula of the feed needs to match what the nutritional needs of the chickens are. Once they start laying eggs, you should start feeding them a layer feed. So that one we can buy at the store. For commercial growers, they have feed formulation for, you know, after six months of laying, after two years or, you know, a certain age, there are different feed formulation. You know, even for meat birds, like right now for us, like we, we only use one formula. So if they're going to feed a lot of beets, you know, I would think like, you know, it'll produce a unbalanced diet. I did hear of stories where they manipulated the lighting, where they were able to produce two eggs in one day. But that's very unhealthy. I yeah. wonder though if the if the yolk color is is you know is different with the beets. Ulupono commissioned a study years ago on Maui to determine how they can produce brighter and uh, richer color yolk. You know, and they determined that, you know, chickens that are fed with a lot of greens, basically chickens that can forage, uh, will produce a, a darker, more orangey colored yolk. You know, and there's a market for that too. And the Japanese market are into that. But yeah, beets, I've never heard that before. Now you got me curious. I'll find out. Don't give paper on, on your chickens. I shared this story before. You will have green yolk eggs. Still okay to eat, but kind of disgusting looking. Puke green. So yeah, don't don't ever do that. That's <laughs> so stupid after. But and the funny thing is, or the crazy part is, you don't know which ones, right? And we can't tell what color yolk they are. So you gotta crack it open and I got a bunch of calls after that. And of course, I put the paper in there. So my wife was fuming at me. And it took a while for them to get that green color out too. So, and they probably, it probably messed up their reproductive system too. We talked in the last class about like temperaments of chickens and 
making friends with your chickens and hugging them and having them in your house and stuff and gross. And um, the difference between pets and livestock and stuff and that. I don't know if we need to mention that to this group, you know, just because I think we, I think it came up like the calendars or chicken groups that get together and like look at chickens together. I just want to caution you guys, you know, I, I know there are people out there that they love their chickens and which is totally fine. I want to remind you that chickens have salmonella and campylobacter endemic on their system. So salmonella is in their digestive tract. Because I know people who um, keep chickens as pets. In fact, my old co-worker's mom, they keep their chickens. Well, now I don't remember if they keep their chickens inside the I don't think they keep them inside the house. But they take their chickens with them wherever they go. She lived in um, Keao on the big island on the east side. And then, you know, a co-worker visited. They went to Kona, stayed at a hotel. She's practically, you know, like the chicken lady, right? She would bring her chicken, put her in her bag. They go to restaurants and in the hotel. And she was telling me she was so embarrassed because she, she told her mom, if that rooster ever crow, you're on your own. So basically, you know, that's, that's the kind of person she is. You know, nothing wrong with that if that's your thing, right? I've read articles where people especially kids kiss their chickens don't do that you can pet the chickens you can you know hold them whatever but make sure you wash your hands i don't suggest you keep your chickens inside the house because like i said digestive tract have salmonella so you don't want that poop even if you clean it you know you don't want any of that stuff cross contaminating some surfaces that you know might make you sick or maybe not you sick, but somebody else sick. Just a caution. This happened years ago. We got a call from the hatchery. We got the chicks, our batch of chicks. And she, uh, Max Yasagi called and said, oh, um, they were asking if they could borrow a couple chicks. And I thought it was an odd request. They're the hatchery, they should have chicks. But apparently they sold all their chicks that they didn't have any for that time. And I was, I got curious and I asked what it's, what it's for. She said, uh, this magazine article called them up. They wanted to do a photo shoot of chicks and of people that, uh, it's like subgroup of people that like to drink wine after work while watching their chickens. Nothing is weird to us anymore after all these years, cause we get calls and whatever, but yeah, so there's a subgroup of people out there um, which are being featured in this magazine. I didn't bother to ask what kind of magazine it was. You know, I, I got to say, though, I don't know if you guys ever had ducks, but ducks are very entertaining. You know, we had ducks and my wife would just, when she's washing dishes, would look out the window. She would literally stop doing whatever she's doing and just stare at the ducks. They got some really cool behavior, to say the least. Mm -hmm. I think it was last year, if not early. No, I think it was last year. There is a virulent strain of the avian flu. I think it's called the H5N5, if I'm not mistaken. It affects the birds, very fatal. And last year, this guy in the UK got it. So it transferred. So it's, it's really rare for that to happen. And the reason why he got it is because his pet ducks live inside in his house. I think he lived far up north in the UK. Uh, my wife lived up there and she said, it's always cold, it's, it always rain. You know, people rarely go outside because of the weather. I mean, I cannot imagine having a duck inside your house. So we had ducks before and like I said, you know, when they poop, it's bad. But <laughs> what's worse is when, um, they lay eggs and they lay on the eggs. And if they ever have to stand up and poop, oh my gosh, like a thousand times worse. So anyway, uh, just be careful. Don't keep chickens in your house.